why do you make art? Um, probably because years, years ago when I was a new father, I was reading Henry Miller, the books by Henry Miller, and I learned, and I always wanted to be a writer from college, and Henry Miller mentioned that uh, he painted when he wasn't writing and did watercolors, so I started with watercolors when I was attempting to write, hack write, and I hack watercolored, and it was 25, 30 years ago, just to pass the time. And uh, that's why I make art now, to pass the time, but to uh, um, die and have all this go to my family. To sell, not, not for dumpstering. Okay. And there's nothing else to do besides be a, a cook or a dishwasher. Uh, where are you from and how does that affect your work? I am from Utica, New York, which is central New York. Where am I going with this? So I was raised kind of like in working class and, you know, with an intense work ethic uh, from my mother and father and even uh, stepfather to that degree and stepmother. So my first job, I was 15 in a restaurant and it was a tough job where I was a, um, a dishwasher in a, 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 in a mentally ill uh, person's restaurant and he would was very violent, and one time I was dishwashing, all the time when I was dishwashing, he would punch me up and down my body, my first job, and I'd go home with bruises, and uh, he'd, sometimes he'd pick me up by my crotch and, and just lay punches up and down my body, and so that's the type of place where I grew up, where it was okay, and that was, that was kind of normal, and I think that was my first look into work, working for the man, right? So, in it never got any easier, meaning I always thought if I don't, if I don't move quick, if I don't move fast, you know, I'm going to get punched <laughs> or something. So I think I paint fast now, I, I, I'm hyperactive in many ways, and I think that's sort of my upbringing, not so much how the geography of Utica influenced me, except that it would be probably lower middle class upbringing, which we know now makes you weird. Um, how, how long does it usually take you to complete a painting? It depends on the size of the painting and what I'm doing. Um, this one here took uh, six hours, maybe seven, and uh, from stretch to or, um, gesso to paint. And, but it's also you know, kind of abstract, figurative, fast, weird, no, not paying attention to things. I did one close to this size, probably around like this, for a commission that took me I don't know, 40 hours or 50 hours uh, this winter, and uh, but that was I had to be careful and, and uh, make sure everything was working to my client's specs, and which sucks. It's no fun. So this is how I enjoy painting. In fact, I'm just learning now how to be a little bit more free and not care um, about you know uh, rendering. So this would take six hours out of pa most paintings. I do a lot of day paintings. Um, this would have taken a day. This would have taken a day. This was in the oil, so probably two days. And, and so 18 by 24 and under would take me a day, maybe two tops to, to do. And paper paintings, every day I do a paper painting if I have paper lying around. So what are some of the mediums and substrates that you would typically use now? I use acrylics. I love, love to use golden paints, which is a, uh, for you international folks, I don't know if you get them over there in Europe and Asia and Australia and other places, uh, Africa, but uh, I use, uh, they're local, they're right down the road, about a uh, two hour drive, and an amazing high, amazing high acrylic, uh, excellent, expensive. So there's a long story, but I, I go through their seconds program because I do a lot of uh, donating my time and work through paint um, to raise money for, I don't want to call them charities, but for stuff. And uh, so they give me these seconds paints, it's called. They're, it's their rejects. So I get a whole bunch of great rejects, like, you know, fluid paints, like that don't quite, they're a little bit too fluid. 
you know. And uh, you know, heavy heavy body paints are a little bit too tarry, uh, but they work out, and they're sometimes free, and most times free. Otherwise, I use whatever I can get a hold on, craft paints, or uh, I can't pronounce this, but I think it's Utrecht paints. Uh, they're affordable. Liquitex basics, that's cheap stuff to do the underlying or mixing. Other than that, oils I hate. Uh, oils are, are, I believe oils are a, a fool's game if you're trying to, uh, I think oils have, get too much um, lip service because it's what everybody used for four, four or five hundred years, so everyone thinks art is is oil. You know, you're you're not a painter unless you use oils. I think it's if you like oils and you're very comfortable with them, wonderful. But if you work fast like me, they're horrible. They're the worst thing in the world. So you're not going to see me using oils. Um, I don't know how to even paint. I'm 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 naive in the fact that I've had no schooling painting. So if I had to do an under under painting before I and then wait a week or two to do the next part of the painting, that's that's creepy. So it's like to me, it's just paint a picture, get the get the feeling out, the whatever you want to say, expression, and uh, we can do that now since 1945 or whatever because we have plastic, and it works, and it even lasts longer than oil. So I mean, you know, you're not going to have a you know a, a Ronnie Angelo deteriorate in 15,000 years, but you know. So there you go. Um. Substrates? Uh, anything that I can paint on that is, uh, I prefer I prefer canvas. I like wood, uh, like thin wood that's strong enough to not bend when you gesso it or paint it. Uh, I like smooth surfaces. So uh, I can't probably see it, but maybe you can see this is like I made a um, turntable, a little stereo box, a little, a little music box, and it's made out of wood. And, um, I can paint on that no problem. Found objects. Uh, I got a tabletop over there. Um, yeah. Anything. Paper. Oh, paper because it's cheap and easy and thin, and you can store it and stack it. So below below me here, there's boxes of paper paintings full, which you're seeing right now at Edgeworth at Edgeworth uh, Gallery. Some. Do shipping costs ever Im impact what your substrate choice? Yes. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, this painting is useless because of all the people I hang around with, nobody could afford the shipping. So, or, you know, unless they're local. And where I live in Oswego, New York, is it's wonderful the people who do buy paintings here, the friends and, and family and acquaintances, and it's great, but I don't want them to be my... my um, I don't want them to be my provider. I feel like I'm always hawking to the people I want to hang around with. And uh, there might be a little bit of a, you know, let's make Ron feel good, let's buy some of his paintings. And I'd rather I'd get excited when someone from nowhere, some, from somebody I don't know buys a painting of mine. It, I mean, I practically give them away. But something like this, I couldn't, because shipping alone to, to Europe would be thousands of dollars. Okay? So, you know, um, so, yes, I consider shipping costs. So that's why another reason why I make paper paintings, because I know I can just slip them in an envelope and mail them for relatively cheap in this internet age. Right. What's your favorite time of day to work? Mornings. I get uh, my schedule is very uh, repetitive, and set. It used to be nights when I was homeschooling my um, daughters. Um, I would work in the day, and then at night I'd paint. Uh, homeschool in the day and night at paint, but then when they, they're off and gone and making their own lives, now I began morning painting. But my day is simple. I rise, have my coffee, do my interneting, and have coffee with my wife. She goes to work and I paint. And I paint always, at least until noon. And if it's really going good, I'll paint um, afterwards in the afternoon. But So about four hours a day. On really good days, it's six hours of painting. Do you have a favorite subject matter, or where do you find inspiration when you choose what to paint? Oh boy, I don't even know. It's all, okay, 
this is interesting because I'll, I'll carry it or I'll mention something else too. I never draw a picture before I paint, so there's no drawing on the canvas. There's no, there's no even thought about what I'm going to do, really. There never is. So when I get up in the morning, if I'm feeling angsty about the state of the world, maybe I'll start off and I'll start titling because I remember I wanted to be a writer. Uh, everything I think of l literally, I always have something to say in words up here, even though I might not be very artistic in implementing them, but I definitely am thinking literally all the time. So I'll be painting and throwing color on, and I'm going, oh, this looks like it's a, you know, uh, I don't know, kangaroo punching somebody out or whatever, and, and I'll just go with that and go with that, and it could turn into something else. It's, I think um, Richard Bledsoe has mentioned that he does intuitive painting, and that's definitely what I do, intuitive painting. Uh, uh, without, without worry about rendering, I never use anything but a brush or voila, this, this tool. Why can I not come up with the name of this tool? Scraper. Palette knife. So do you collaborate? You mentioned Richard Bledsoe. Do you collaborate with other artists and you, do you have a network of artists and ha that support you? Yes, because of the internet. Um, the reason why I'm having this show right now is because I found, or Edgeworth found me, or, or I don't know. Um, I've had several, I've exhibited um, paintings in 2017 in Watkins Glen. Um, I took uh, 37 artists, paintings, 36 painters from around the, the world in the nine countries, living in nine countries. and. They graciously sent two of their pieces each, one or two, but mostly two, and I exhibited them in Watkins Glen, and that's a lot of a lot of fun. And I would I would urge anyone to do this when they can get off the internet, use it to find people who paint, and then work something out where you can just what Edgeworth is doing right now, where he said, hey, can you send some paintings? Yeah, I, I you know paper paintings he said are cheaper, and I said, yeah, I know, so I sent them. So that's what you're looking at, uh, what he's showing. But I have a great rapport with uh, se several Russian painters. I've showed their work also here, brought, and they've sent their work to me. Um, also, Lupo Sol um, in Spain, I've worked with him, uh, bringing his paintings here. Again, if you want to be happy as a painter and not just, just you know, grow into an old curmudgeon, you, you know, collaborate, commune with other painters whenever you can and not on the internet, it's boring. You can use that as a tool to show, but there's a feeling you get when you um, work with others and help others too, and help each other. So what have others said about your work? Nobody's really said much. In fact, <laughs> it's, in fact I, don't think, I don't think I like what I paint, so I don't expect anybody else to really like it. Um, I've had people tell me I'm very prolific and busy and, and I'm definitely a worker. Nobody's telling me I'm not, I'm not working at it. Uh, and I get, you know, on the internet you get, you get hearts and likes and, in the, in the, and sometimes you'll get somebody to say this is awesome and or great but it's rare when I get a feedback that makes me feel um, enthused onto the next painting. Uh, it, I think that all comes from, I think it, I generate that in my delusional self all, all the time. And uh, it's even friends, even friends have a difficult time just saying, hey, great job, good job, keep going. It's just one of those things I think, I think people don't like creative people. I know I don't like other people's art mostly um, because I'm jealous of it most of the time or envious. So I think all the bad things come out. Um, when I say I don't like it, of course I like it because I'm envious of it. Uh, so. I think the internet is a very bad place to 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 move on with art to get better. Uh, it's, it's actually slows you down, which is ironic because it's supposed to be so fast. See? You've spoken to this a little bit, but uh, what are your other interests, and how do you feel like they influence your work? Gardening, but it, it doesn't really influence my work. Writing. Is like I said, I'm literary with everything. My titles, if you look at my titles, if you just go onto my Instagram account, whatever, you're going to see me, you're going to see a lot of titles that are s stories. And I used to think that 
and probably partially is this way. A, a painting should say enough with the painting, where people say it's the viewers, you know, the viewer gets out of it what they want. I don't think that's right. But I'll talk about that too later. Is uh, um, I express it with my writing and my painting. So I have something to say about my painting. Damn it, it's my painting. So if I want to tell you this painting is about, uh, it's called conformity noise. If I have a problem, if I wanted to make the painting be, um, I, uh, I don't want to go outside my garden because there's people looking at me. If I wanted to title that, that I will title it that because it's pretty much what it means. I don't like the noise of conformity of where I live in suburbia. I could have made that title a paragraph and be completely satisfied with it. A lot of people would say, oh, that's because your painting's lacking and we don't get that out of it. But I think, I think anybody who calls their painting untitled is, is, I mean, you can call it whatever you want, it's your painting, but it's, it's, it can't possibly be untitled. You can't possibly make something and not have a feeling about it. So it's, it's incredibly important for me to tell you what I think about it because I believe art is the person. If it was just the outcome, then let's just have computers making it. Let's just throw Google up there and say, hey, make this, generate a painting for me. Um, so it's very important for me to uh, tell you that I don't care what you think about it. I'll tell you what it is, and if you, if you like that, that's fine. Do you think um, art at large, or, or more specifically, your art is important to society, and how? Art is, all art is important to society, but I always, and I think this more, more now than I have in the past, that art is a kind of like a, there's something wrong with you if you're, if you're making art in the modern times. Um, I think I think it's a good wrong and it could be wrong in a good or bad way. You're just not satisfied. You're not you know you haven't reached Satori. You know you're not reached enlightenment. You know, which I think anybody who's trying to you know they're trying to have make life worth living in every moment. So so if you're always I think art is a a malformity sort of thing. Like we're doing it to to especially expressive art to get that off our shoulders to get this chip off our shoulders and. Uh, um, so what was the question again? Well, the question is, how is art important to society? Well, how is, and is my art important to society? Absolutely not. Uh, it, 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 but it's, it's important to me, very important to me. I meditate. I would have exploded. I really would have exploded 15 years ago if I didn't do this. And uh, so it's very helpful for my psyche. Um, if it makes a person feel inspired to say, like, um, geez, I, I too can get a, a, a wonderful wife to work for me and I'll paint pictures in the basement, then yes, if it makes them feel good and makes that wife feel good, if it makes your life better, keep doing it. And that's, that's what art is. I think there's way too much artifice in art, way too much pompous crap. Art is worth, art is worth, really worth to me, the paper it's, it's painted on. And that's, that's why I have come up with a wonderful, for me, um, pricing system that I will probably have attached somehow a link to this in this video. Um, we're, we put too many errors on our on our crea creations, and we completely leave out children who make amazing art, and uh, it's just not important because they're not because they're children. And I think where art is good is people who give it up for for career anyway, give up the rest of the workaday world to make a career is that they chose to be children again. So that's that's where art is important to me. Uh, um, to keep that childhood in them, to keep that childlikeness in them, and to get back to it. So to answer the final question, no, art is, art is very important to be in the world. It must be in the world. It is, everybody should be doing it when they can. And uh, But is it as important as a, you know, a pompous thing of importance, something to put in a museum? No. And that's maybe why we're starting to see so much struggling in museums and, and things like that. It's great for history because it, it tells stories and stories are great. Are you interested in history? Yes. I was a history major in college and I love to, um, I love local personal history, um, how I think genealogy is really cool, people looking into their past to see where they come from. The problem is with genealogy they don't go far enough, um, they always stop at some written word or something, so I think um, anthropology would be very interesting to me too. And I bring that I bring that knowledge and, and study into my painting all the time. I had a show about my ancestors 
ten years ago, which was really uplifting, wrote a book about them, and, and studied them, researched them, went to their graves all around the Northeast, and, and painted their portraits. So. Do you incorporate, you know, history in the making uh, into, your, into your work? Yeah, sure. Oh, what do you mean, like history in the making? Well, more pop culture, I suppose, or, or current events. Oh, yeah. Oh, lots of that, yes. Every, every day I read the news like you and, or know the news, and, and sometimes I'm reactionary, and I know that people say, well, that's not art, that's politics, or something like that, and I cannot agree, I cannot disagree more. Uh, if we're not, politics is uh, how do you want society structured? Uh, it's groups. How do groups of people in, living in society want, want it structured? If that's not, if art cannot be a reflection of that, then I, I'm just laughing. Like, what do you think the cave paintings were? You know, oh, uh, Fred, you know, looks like Fred can do nothing. Let's have him paint the horses. You know, that makes no, that makes no sense. There was, there's much deeper meaning to what he was painting or she was painting. And if it was, you know, if it was art, they probably would have ate him because if it was just art for art's sake, um, I think it was, that dude can draw a horse. If we don't have horses, we die. That's politics. Uh, so if, if there's a, if you have a feeling about how the world or your world should be structured and, and you paint about it, that's not a political painting. That's what, probably what um, the major museums want you to think because they just want, they want more Monet flowers. Or if they don't want Monet flowers, they want somebody's poop in a can. You know, it's like not art to me. It's uh, art is, you know, you, nature's, nature's already there. Um, have a feeling about the world, your, your, your daughters, your, your grandmother, your government, and, and, and express it, whether it's in painting, singing, sculpture, theater. So getting back to the societal question, would you say that cave painting, you know, that you just described um, had meaning for the society that surrounded that painter, or, um, you know, what did it give them? It probably gave them comfort, as my guess would be the first thing, and, and, and we're human beings, look at us, how great we are, and uh, I think the same reason we would use, I think the same reason we, reason we would use art today. So, my art's showing in London, and, and it's the paper paintings that I do just for practice, they're not, it's not my... And it's not something where I would go, I want to change society with this. Of course not. So, so, but I also don't think anybody in London should give a crap what the hell I'm doing, really. I mean, I, I, think, I'll, I think my art should be local. And if I can't, if I can't convince my children or my, or my wife with a, with a path that I'm going on or a way to look at life, you know, the, the, the path to more wonder and things like that, or my best friend... Or, or my local neighbors, if I can't get them to think, I'm not going to get a, a Londoner to think about, about it, or, or somebody in, you know, in South Africa, or, you know, Zimbabwe, it's just, it, everybody has, um, I think art is, to me, is very local in that way, and if it's universal, then it's kind of, it kind of be like boring, like, we all wear shoes, so, you know, okay, nice shoe you painted, you know, you know, we all, they're not always, most of us. So the cave painter hanging out, um, I would imagine it was it was spiritual, and that would bring me to stuckism and why I do it. Uh, spiritual for the clan, um, for the group, or for themselves. That's probably the underlying reason why I love the idea of stuckism and, and some of the manifest, much of the manifesto, is there's something about how we express ourselves. It's a lesson to be learned by the people near you, as much as, it, you know, the internet that it is for the world. Um, so, sorry, that might be bad one, but... Is your paint drying? It's not paint, it's oil-based, so it'll, it's just sticky. Um, so, also getting, kind of turning back to something you said just now um, about museums or, or commercial interests uh, and or careerism, how do you feel about... Um, the implications of career and commercialism on uh, artists. Yep. It, yeah, that's, that, every, day I, every day I grapple with this. Um, I, I come from that lower class, lower working class um, society, and it's, it's in my bones to work, but also to provide as a man. And I've never been able to do that, so I've been a complete nonconformist since... Um, and I, but, but we've chosen to, my wife and I have chosen this path. 
So I am very um, against this idea of art and money. Um, so I've had several times in the past where just give me a silver dollar for any painting, any size painting, I'll take a silver dollar, just so we can have that stupid exchange. I can say, oh, I got $25 inflated dollars for the silver dollar, so I got something, you got something. Um, I think the word career is a, is a loaded word. Uh, you can have a career as a um, restaurateur, uh, you can have a career as a garbage man, you can have a career as a, a marketing executive. Um, but in the United States, I, don't, I can't speak for the rest of the world, you cannot have a career as a painter until a museum authenticates you as a painter or a major gallery. Then they could say, that when you read them in the books, and during his, and their biographies and throughout his career, they use all the time, they use the word career. If any painter goes into it for a career or any artist, they're, 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 they're saddled. They're all of a sudden saddled with this idea of I have to make something of it, I have to and I have to make money. So I, I don't know if you all know this, but Roy Lichtenstein um, taught here in, in Oswego, New York, where I lived for three years. And he had a career as an art teacher and went off to uh, have a career as an art teacher in New Jersey and showed his paintings to a gallery and two years later was uh, world famous. Roy, no matter, Roy, for the next 30 years, 38 years of his life, painted the same stuff, the same style, over and over. That's be, that's what career does to you. So, people, and of course he, he would go off and like, he painted like differently, but the same. Meaning he never felt like, I have to do something new, else I'm going to burst. Um, so that just means he was, he was saddled to consumerism, commercialism, and career. And I think anybody, I think this, I think the internet does this to people too. I think it makes you all like uh, keep, oh, I, I got 40 likes for this one, so yeah, if I paint that again, I'll get 40 likes. I actually um, really am interested in what Edgeworth does with his Instagram, is he puts, uh, he just puts hashtag Edgeworth Johnson. And that's enough. And, you know, and, and it's, that's what it is. It's not hashtag contemporary painting, contemporary art, painting, art. Uh, uh, joy of man's desire, expressionism, all this stuff I put down, it, that's artifice and that's me trying to get noticed so I can make a buck because I come from that lower class world that says, if you're doing something you better make some money at it. But I'm teaching myself and it takes a while uh, to, to, to practice this. So someday Edgeworth I'll catch up to you. So if not by career and, and, and not by um commercialism, how do you define success as an artist? You don't. You, you grapple every day with, with horrible existentialism and, and feelings of doubt, self-doubt, and you and you probably make another painting. Um, you, you don't deal with it in my, in my community, my culture. I also am the only person four blocks that way, four blocks that way, or that way, or that way, well that way's a lake, that hangs their laundry. So I'm home all day, I, I, I hang my laundry in the summer. So um, I'm never going to be able to to uh, grapple with the fact that a care provider, it's what I did most of my life, and uh, adult life, is, uh, is taken care of. So if a care provider isn't taken care of, sure as heck the artists aren't being taken care of. So what was the question? Uh, how do you define sex, success oh, as an success artist? success is easy to define. Success is, <laughs> is um, um, a lot harder. So I don't know, there's probably a John Lennon tune about that, I think, right? Um, uh, or Bob Dylan's No Success Like Failure. Failure is no success at all. So, I think. So, can your work ever really be considered abstract, since there seems to be always an allegory or an expression uh, attached to uh, the work? I don't do abstract painting. I have it. I do it sometimes as a joke, and when I try to do something abstract, I do like in this painting here, where there's eyeballs and stuff, and, and creatures and little cars or something. So. So, all of my stories, all of my paintings are a story, uh, and tell a story, even if they don't have, even if I tell you this, if, if I say this title is me driving in my car on a Saturday night when I was 18, if, I, if that's the title of the story, and it's in a picture of a person driving in a car, obviously, if you're looking at it, that's not your interpretation, it could be you driving the car, or your Uncle Fred, or something. That's, that's the subjectivity you walk away with if you want that in your house. Um, you'll buy it. Otherwise, it's mine. I made it. I'm going to tell you what I see in it, what it is, and if you want to call it 
art or make it your art, I'll be happy to relinquish the title. Just give me a hundred bucks. So yes, there's stories to everything I everything I write, uh, everything I paint. Um, if you want to hear about it, I'll tell you. Um, sometimes if, if I'm making a painting, I'll, I'll, I'll paper painting in the morning, I'll just go oh, like this and then fill it in and go, oh, it's starting to look like a cat. Even that I might title, you know, a you know, strange thing with a, the word cat in it. Um, and the story would be, that's a, um, this is what I was thinking while I was painting this cat. So yes, I do, and I'm kind of contradicting myself and I understand, but I do that often, but again, when it comes right down to it, it's mine, I'll say what I want about it. And um, I don't know if I've mentioned it before about untitled people who call their paintings untitled. I don't understand that. So what's the difference between untitled and no title okay? No title okay is, is me. Oh, yeah, I do that. I do that. I, I call it no titlio. That's how you pronounce it. Oh, sorry. No titlio. And I also have been lately putting titled instead of untitled. So it's title. I just didn't come up with one. So you can, you can maybe put any title you want to it. It may be the same with um, no titlio. So right now I don't have a title for it. But when you buy it and give me $100, you can title it whatever you'd like. Do you think um, the further that you get away from representational art, do you think you get further away from stuckist uh, art? I'm not getting further away from representational art. I don't, I don't even, I, I'm always making a figure, always. There's, there's nothing I've done ever that doesn't have a figure in it. So, yeah. It, but I don't want to. I don't want to limit stuckism to just something like that because I, I, I would even disagree. With, uh, okay, Philip Guston. What, so Philip Guston's only a stuckist if he's making his cartoon paintings, or is Philip Guston, you know, also a stuckist when he was making his um, abs completely abstract paintings and calling them summer or whatever? It would be up to Philip Guston to call himself whatever he wants to, and he can read the manifesto, look at the precepts. Uh, he could look it up before and say, all artists, um, if you don't paint, you're not an artist. You know, and he can go, ah, oh, okay, I, I feel that. I understand what he's saying there. I get it. Yeah, I want to call myself a stuckist. Philip Guston, if he was alive, can call himself the Queen of England. I don't care what. It's, he's an individual. He has every right to. And subjectively, you could say you're not the Queen of England, but if Philip Guston doesn't care, you know, neither should you. So I will always be what I want to be. Maybe next year I'll be a, a fluppist, you know, and because uh, I want to be a fluppist. Are there any other contemporary movements that have spoken to you, um, maybe that, that as much as stuckism, or do you not consider yourself a stuckist at all? No, I, yes, um, no, the only thing that was, when you say contemporary, I'm just going to say the last, I don't know, 150 years. Like I said, I don't know much about art and art movements, but I do know that artists were better better when there was no internet. I know art, and when I say artists were better, not their, not their painting maybe, but them being as human beings. So when I see, uh, there's a, there's a when, when somebody goes into Charles Thompson's apartment or home in, uh, in London and, and he's just showing his backyard and where he sits, that should be me going over there for tea, hanging out with him, because we both paint and discussing painting. Um, same with Edgeworth, same with Lupo Soul, same with uh, my, um, uh, Andrew Makarov, uh, Olga Naus, you know, these are people that that I think are my, I actually think they friendly thoughts and want, would want to be their close friends. But the, the difference between Paris and 1890 is you would be, and you would go see each other, and you'd be, you'd have all that envy, jealousy, shared, shared experience, um, enthusiasm, politics would all be sitting at the same table drinking the same coffee or tea, or booze. With me it would be beer, I like pints. So, what I'm lacking most is, as a painter and an artist is that camaraderie that is physical and, and in the same location. So I get this, I get a little bit of it with my friend, uh, friends Mike and Eric, who I, I get, uh, and, and others who I consider um, artists of the spirit if they're not yet practicing it because they have, well, they are practicing it, but they have day jobs is what I'm trying to say. But I would really wish that we, that we both could meet, all could meet in a, uh, just a cafe to talk and to talk about our art and, and things. Anyway, so I forgot the question, but I, I, I think I was on to something. We're, we're, we're really missing out on, on that. We should still have our oh, art movements. We should still have people getting together in, in, in coffee shops and, and talking about their art, not showing each other their Instagram photos. So that, it's not romantic to think that way. It's, you can still do both. 
Um, you can use the internet as a tool, but you got to get out. You got to get out and physically see each other. That's another reason why I'm really excited about Edgeworth's uh, many shows he's been putting out. Uh, several shows. Uh, I, he's, he's done Charles Thompson. He's doing uh, Emma Pugmire and, and others. I can't wait to see them because it's just they're together. They're physically sitting in the same room talking. Very important. Mm -hmm. And with Google Translate, we should be able to do that with my Russian friends too. So when I go to Russia, St. Petersburg, we can just sit there and use that tool not to look at our paintings. We can look at our paintings together and then we can talk using that tool, which will be fun. It will sound like this. Hello, Bulda and Andrew. Um, uh, let's see. There was one more question I wanted to ask. Um, how, if, do you ever have slumps or creative blocks? And if so, uh, how do you get, uh, get we past those? We were just those? in Spain. It was my first creative block ever. But it wasn't with painting. It was, it was with thinking and feeling. We got stuck in Spain for, t uh, for um, twice as long as we were supposed to be there. And by our government, left us high and dry. Um, long story. But I came back and felt disoriented like never before. I wasn't feeling creative. I was surly. Um, and as far as the past 20 years go, that's the only time that I felt um, like a writer's painter's block. But I still was painting. It just wasn't... Uh, there was no uh, peace to it. It was forced. Going through the motions. So did you do anything other than practice to get past that feeling? I read the Vedanta philosophy and, and other books, um, especially like the author Alan Watts, who makes me think of uh, um, ways to, to uh, uh, look at the world differently and, and healthily and uh, breathe better. I also tape my mouth closed every night, and uh, so I breathe through my nose, so I don't snore and have to get one of those awful machines that help help people breathe, which I think is a scam. So you just take some tape. Put it over your mouth like this. I get painter's tape, and blue tape. This is a little too strong. Masking tape is too strong. It pulls all your whiskers out and it hurts. And uh, and I don't snore, so it's great. And it, I think it's helped me in many ways. That's one thing I do. I do a lot of walking and, and, and walking meditation. Painting is meditation. Um, so I have ways to make myself feel content. Uh, lucky me. Others don't have that, those um, time for that, and I'm just I'm just fortunate. What's your favorite painting to date of your own? Of my own? I, the last one I made, which would be this one. So it's always the last one you made? No, that's not true. Let's just look. I'll just um, find something hanging in here. I like stuff like this just because I don't like this. This isn't my favorite painting, but I like it because I made... Um, it's done on, a, on an old bath towel that I used for 20 years. So I cut it up, made a couple paintings on it. It's a terry cloth. It's very hard to paint on, but it was fun. It's me coming out of the shower. Um, I, I don't love it, but I like the fact that it's new, and, and I've done a new style, and uh, anytime that happens, I feel, very, I feel very excited when I make something new for me, so if I can do some new style that, like, like okay, for instance, I've been, the past two years since COVID, I ran out of brushes and, uh, during COVID and wasn't ordering them for some reason, probably because we weren't rich at the time, but all of my brushes are just so frayed, just so frayed, you know broken at the ends or, or whatever. So I paint a lot with, like in a scribble way and, and not worrying about neatness. And I think that's very freeing for me and makes me feel better. So I actually enjoy frayed brushes. I also have these brushes here. They're like, they cost 50 cents or a dollar in a hardware store. And they just make great, you know, I don't know, they're just great to work with. Uh, they're very freeing. When I was younger, or younger, 10, 15 years ago, I always hoped I could make big paintings and use record albums as my palette knife. And just, you know, just slop tons of paint, just go like this. So I have that urge to just lay tons of paint, but obviously economy does not, like, um, satisfy that urge for me, because we can't afford to, to just lay paint on like that. When, sometimes when I get house paint, and, or just find a, you know, get the cheap stuff handed over to me, I won't go buy this stuff, because... You know, come on, I got, I got scruples. And, uh, but if I get something like this, it's great because I'll just use it to back the painting or 
I can use a ton of paint for cheap. And that's another thing about the internet, again, I think, which is fooling our eyes, is when you, you put something you did up on the internet, it's, a, it's, uh, it's making it look a lot better than it is. And, uh, and, and I even catch myself doing that with my wife, with Rose. I, I show her my work, even though it's literally a one <laughs> flight of stairs down, because I paint, the, uh, paint my basement studio, sitting right here, I show her on the phone because it looks better. And uh, everything becomes crisper, and I don't know what it is. Uh, uh, and it's a, a, we're lying to ourselves, so show your paintings in public. Let, let yourself be humiliated and humbled many times. And uh, that would be some, that's some damn good stuckest advice right there, you know. Humiliate yourself. Do you often try to fool your wife? Fool her? All the time. Yep. Yes. She thinks I'm rich. She thinks I'm a trust fund that I don't collect until I'm 60. I want to thank Edgeworth for uh, having me, having my paintings in the studio and for providing this uh, platform. Um, what else, what, what am I asking? Just. Is there anything else you want to tell the viewers? Um, nope. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, I do, I do. <laughs> thank you for viewing. Um, and uh, I hope, well, okay. I mean, now I'll do my, my my plug. Rose has promised that when I die and I'm going, to, she's going to outlive me. That I will be famous because she's going to um, make sure that all the museums. She's a marketer for her job, and she's going to make sure that all the museums and galleries out there know of me and, and, and come get the work. So, whatever you buy now will be worth at least 1.5 times what it's worth today. Yes. Thank you very much. Goodbye. I want to give a shout out before I show you some of my paintings, uh, give you their titles to uh, four people I'm very fond of who uh, live in um, Russia uh, and, and are, are painters. And uh, the guy there, second from the left, Alexei Stepanov, and I uh, started a uh, um, shared painting relationship in, 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 I think it was 2015, where we both were on the Stuckist, website, uh, Stuckist Facebook page and we decided to. Um, exchange, start exchanging paintings and showing them. And there, through him, I met uh, Elena Levina, um, Olga Naus, to, um, and uh, Andrew Makarov. Uh, they um, are wonderful people, and uh, they teach us. And in, in our relationship we had, I think, is very inspiring to other painters and, and creative people who want to show their work uh, and kind of like, like take the middleman out of it. Uh, you can do this yourself, folks. Uh, I wouldn't be here at Edgeworth's Gallery if it wasn't for um, Alexi jump-starting the idea in my mind. And, uh, and I've shown um, all of their work with great joy. So uh, get on it. All right, let's get to the paintings. All right, this painting's uh, titled America Deflating, and uh, the galleries want you to call this a political painting, and but it is just a painting uh, with a title that is about uh, the superpower of the United States uh, getting weak. So it's just another thing like painting um, flowers and calling them, uh, this is my aunt's flower garden. Right? It's just a painting. Uh, this is why I like, uh, I think, uh, political, the idea of uh, galleries and uh, the movers and shakers in the art world calling something a political painting is because they like to marginalize. And uh, this is my art, this is my expression, and it's what I want to talk about. Uh, and tomorrow I might just make flowers for flowers sake, but right, this painting is called America Deflating, and it's to me a very stuckest painting because it could be any style and idea I want it to be. Um, and, but it is, it does come from me. Another a political painting, um, Monday Morning King of the Class War, America Deflating, the previous painting and this one were uh, painted in 2020. Happy Man Waking from a Sad Dream, uh, this would be uh, 2020 as well. Yeah, I have a um, I'm pretty happy all around. I think I'm a very um, fortunate person, and uh, and I I use humor a lot in my work, 
and uh, but uh, humor sometimes I might be disguising a uh, a deep, deep, and pressing despair. A very pretty woman squatting. Acrylic on paper, uh, 2020. Stuckest pussy. This is 2020. Uh, here's just uh, probably still feeling a little bit uh, COVID lockdown and you can see I'm using the frayed brush um, but the main point to make here is that uh, here's this cat with a Ronnie that would be my name and I'm eating the store-bought cat food but what I should be doing is exploring new uh, pathways new styles maybe techniques and uh, um, I'm dreaming you know I'm eating the spoiled you know I'm a spoiled cat eating my store-bought cat food but I'm dreaming of those walking or, or swimming pieces of meat to eat, but I'll have to get off my butt and hunt. Hey, come join the Scouts! 2020. Again, all these are acrylic on paper, except a couple are on um, plexiglass. Uh, uh, this was a little project I was doing. I did break out eventually during during my uh, lockdowns and, and started to think about, uh, let's do a project on uh, the Cub Scouts, which is uh, in the United States is a uh, it's uh, like the Junior Boy Scouts. Uh, and when I was uh, young, I cheated um, to get all of my Cub Scout badges. I just signed, had my mother sign all the um, activities I was supposed to complete. Um, and it pretty much was a precursor to the way I would live the rest of my life. Is kind of like, uh, uh, I don't know, winging it, fly by night, what have you. Uh, perhaps, I don't know. But anyway, I felt guilty and uh, is a 54 year old man and I thought it was time to uh, redo my badges and I got the Cub Scout, the old Cub Scout books from the 70s and, and began to um, do it the right way and uh, have my wife uh, Rose signed, sign off on each activity. And I made a few paintings about uh, rejoining the Scouts. Today I retired my mangled COVID brush. And this is where I just, uh, this is again, you know, during the lockdown time when we're all hiding out. And uh, I decided to uh, finally give up. And the, the fray was just getting too crazy. And so I painted my last picture with my favorite brush. Um, and, uh, and then just taped it to the painting. And then, yeah, I de definitely felt spent. This painting was all about fish until the human hand. Now we're getting into 2021. And this is, I think, I believe this is plexiglass. This painting won't uh, win any awards, but it might let you see where I'm coming from. Paper. Three faces with hair. And the reason why I'm throwing this one up is to show you um, you know, I'll, I'll paint on anything I can get a hold of, especially when I've, I'm out of canvas. Uh, these are smoked salmon trays, so I must, I must have had a party. It was probably after the holidays or something. And, uh, you know, you wash them up, they always have that smell. My gosh, that, that, that smoked salmon smell stays. And I would scrub them, and uh, in warmer weather, I hang them out of my laundry. Uh, I hang them out with my laundry, but they, you know, just it up, they, they're kind of neat to paint on. Yeah, even my best friend knows she must put on one crazy eye if we're going to coexist. This is just a shout out to a. She's gonna have to have Rose, my wife is gonna have to crazy eye if we want. She wants to stay together, uh, uh, which she does very well. She she um, indulges my behavior. Thank you so much. Um, it, it it keeps me going. This week is our anniversary. A wedding anniversary and there we are when we were first uh, uh, dating. Um, I always like to look at the books I was reading back then. Uh, Hunger by Knut Hampson. I got uh, William Blake. I got uh, Way of the Pilgrim. Uh, Henry Miller books. Kenneth Patchen. Um, and Wake Me Up in Spring which was my uh, daughter's book that I would have read to her. And uh, It's uh, very telling from where we live up here in the north country where it snows like mad for 
five months in the cold is 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 really deep. Um, you need you need a good marriage. So uh, another another idea for painters the world over and struggling artists: marry well. Obviously, an attractive man waiting with ears. And this would be two, uh, 2022. It's 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 more recent. Probably back in uh, February or March. Either way, it's uh, the reason why I put it up here is I like it. Uh, I like what I've done, you know, for a day painting, uh, um, the color, the vibrancy. It's, it's, it means I'm heading in the right direction and for myself. And it, these paintings are becoming easier and easier to, to, to get out. And uh, I, that to me is, I guess, what mastering paint would be. Um, I used to say this phrase I made up called perfecting your limitations. And um, I don't want to be perf perfect in anything, even my limitations. So I think being very, very satisfied with your limitations would be a better way uh, and, a, and, a goal, and a goal to reach. Uh, just imagine your favorite five-year-old uh, when they come to you with something they've done and, and actually you can tell that they're, they, they like it. Uh, if we can have that feeling at 55, um, that's, that would be success. Uh, to answer an earlier question posed by Rose. Village Idiot Herbivore. It's another uh, style I'm happy with, a recent style, at least with the paper paintings. Here's my laundry room, just doing laundry and uh, some recent paintings and some older ones. Um, I hang up paintings all over the house to my wife's chagrin, and uh, it's just you know you 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 got to show them somewhere, right? Not my laundry, and uh, we'll even take it outside. Here's where I hang my laundry, and my backyard. Uh, the front yard has a uh, more interesting garden. Garden. This is an elderberry bush. I'm making elderberry wine right now. It's uh, fermenting in the kitchen. Out here is where I would keep vegetables. There's a perimeter, a bunch of flowers in the perimeter. You can't really see. It's not been a very good year. Pear tree, uh, tomatoes, marijuana, hops, asparagus. Playhouse for the grandchildren. It used to be for the, one of my daughters. And um, that's the house. And now I'm outside here. I told you the garden out front's a little, a little better as far as color. It's not the most colorful time of year, but I have a lot of, a lot of variety. It doesn't look like it. it just looks like echinacea and. I don't know, what are they called? Black-eyed Susans? I got a lot of lavender and um, sedums and, and um, grow what we can. Goes around the house. I took a quick walk down to the uh, to the lake. Um, there's a college near, um, well, obviously, we live in the perimeter of the college. And uh, this free bike has been out. This is what living in suburbia is like. This says free. Nobody wants it because we got so much already. And if you can see way down at the end of the street, there is the lake. It's Lake Ontario. I go for a walk every day, so this is part of uh, my routine. Um, in the afternoons, after painting, we live on the uh, east edge of the college uh, where Rose works. I went to school here, I went to college here, so I haven't really uh, gone more than a quarter of a mile from where I used to have dorm life when I was 20 years old. Alright, so I'm going to turn off for a second and uh, we'll meet up in the lake in about a 10 minute walk. Right down the road here, I'm just, this uh, used to be uh, the, <laughs> years ago it's broken down now and they're actually going to change it and probably just give it. Um, to administration, but it was uh, it was the student lounge where they would show 
um, art, the teachers and students would show their artwork, faculty. Uh, Roy Lichtenstein used to put his paintings right up there, which is kind of neat. Um, before he was the pop painter Roy Lichtenstein, he was the um, Oswegonian teacher, struggling human being Roy Lichtenstein. This is our Rich Hall. This is where my um, wife used to work years ago uh, when we were very young, engaged to be married. I take this walk every day around campus. It's about two miles, but I'm not taking any of the full two. I'm just going to go out on the lake, which is very close. Okay, here we are coming to the lake. This is all on the edge of the campus. These are dorms. So I guess I'll give a plug to uh, SUNY Oswego in upstate New York. If, you, if you're watching this video and you want to go to a good school, there's a lot of um, interesting people who live around here, I think. It's very isolated, but uh, it's got the, uh, I don't know, intellectual stimulation. The college really helps. There's philosophers, mathematicians, uh, painters, you know. There's, um, of course, they're kind of insulated with their academia, but and their money, um, which is nice. Anyway, so here's this is where I live. No, I do not do nautical paintings. I've lived here for 30 some five years and I swim in the lake but I've never taken a, a boat out in it. Oh, it's a beautiful, pristine, wonderful world to live in five months out of the year. Six, yeah, five months. College kids go home and this campus is uh, open, empty. Beautiful. Well, again, this is part of my walk doing the perimeter. The area where we live is it's called the uh, um, Faculty Skid Row. Uh, anyway, look in the 50s and 60s, all these houses went up. Except for this one, it's a fraternity. Very loud at night. So cheap real estate. College house. College house across the street there. A sorority next to the fraternity. So my 95-year-old neighbor, Helen, was in that White House. And uh, she actually knew Roy Lichtenstein. Kind of neat. I don't know why I'm pushing this Roy Lichtenstein thing. It's just, it's, you know, we don't get much of a claim to fame here in Oswego. So, anyway. There's the house. It's home sweet home. Uh, I just noticed my paintings are all signed uh, Poe. Uh, it's not pronounced Poe, it's pronounced Rhone. And it's Cyrillic. And, and here's the story behind that. So it simply says Ron in Russian. And uh, when I was um, getting to know uh, my friends in Russia, they would uh, sign, you know, Dear Poe, their letters. They would write to me or emails. And uh, and I was, at the time, I was always looking for a signature that was simple and, and to the point and, and, and wouldn't make me write upside down left-handed, which is already very difficult to do. So Ronald J. Troop or Ron Troop is a, a tough signature to go with. But P-O-H, which is not really P-O-H, um, was very, very easy and also... Um, simultaneously, I was getting to know Lupo Soul, and his paint, he's, he's uh, signing his painting Soul, S-O-L. And I'm going, oh, I wish I had, a, wish I had an easy, um, easy signature, and boom, it just popped into my brain, and that's it. So uh, that's since 2000, early 2017, late 2016, I have been signing all of my paintings um, Ron in Cyrillic, which is Poe, and that's that. Here's that equation I mentioned earlier. Uh, last year I had a sh uh, an exhibition about how to price a painting, and I'm very serious about this. I've 
tried over the years to these, these random numbers that we come up with are uh, goofy. I've written about it a couple times on, on my Substack, which you can find a link to at, uh, in my uh, website coming, coming up. Anyway, here's the equation. It's very simple. Uh, you want to price your painting? Give yourself a wage. If you think you're the greatest painting, painter on earth, give yourself a Michelangelo wage of $500 an hour, you know? Or if you're like me, you're going to hope for 20 bucks an hour. Uh, for this, any particular painting, how many hours did you work on it? Multiply those two together, wage times hours. Uh, material costs are going to be any, you know, from your frame, if you're selling it with a frame, your substrate, paints, um, and you're going to add that in. And then you're going to add this element X fee, which is um, a 30% percent of wages times uh, the, the price or wage times hours uh, plus materials 30 percent of that and that's that element X that makes you uh, an artist you're the one painting it um, if, uh, you're the one doing it that's the that's the special you um, that you you get and you add that on also and it comes out pretty fair in, in, in random ways I used to price my paintings it, it's usually right around the same cost uh, so try it sometime. It'll make you feel really good about selling to friends and family or anybody. It'll also make you stop selling it for nothing and giving stuff away or never selling it because it's just not fair. And if you spread the word and tell others, uh, I think you, you, we can start a movement with this. Um, and then we're going to put Christie's out of business and, and lots of other places too, this idea of, um, you know, this art market that I think does not exist because there's no there's no real market place for art. And I'd also like to mention this is for um, living artists and working artists. Uh, there's a historical aspect to selling art. I, I understand where uh, prices rise in value. I'm just talking about from if if or if you're at a gallery, obviously you you the gallery would um, uh, set a price a markup so you can get your money. Um, so. Those, those are games that people can choose to play or not. But I'm just saying, when you're selling a painting to a friend or somebody at a show that you're having and you're there, this is a good price or a good method. Here's my website where you'll find links to my social media where I do post daily. An Edgeworth painting I got for my wife Rose a couple of Christmases ago. Thank you, Edgeworth.